Hi, I'm Cameron Harold. I'm about to have a productive conversation with Mike Vardy. I'm excited to talk to another Canadian today, Cameron Harold. This is a conversation that I've wanted to have for quite some time. And it's interesting because he goes down the path of the chief operating officer. And and I, I really like the approach. Um, he is the founder of the COO Alliance, and he's a coach to CEOs and COOs. Cameron's also a keynote speaker, and he's the author of five books. He's coached hundreds of companies in 28 countries, built two 100 multi-million dollar companies, and his Vivid Vision tool is being used globally by thousands of companies. Uh, we had a fantastic conversation. It was a relaxed one, but a productive one, and let's get to it. Here's my conversation with Cameron Harold. Cameron, thanks so much for taking the time to join me today. It's always a pleasure to uh, have a conversation with a fellow Canadian. We can start to let our accents flow a little bit more clearly. <laughs> <laughs> I was, my ex-wife used to try to coach me on getting rid of it. I'm like, it's never going to happen. I can't get rid of it. So the longer you spend here in the Pacific Northwest part of Canada, it does tend to blend yeah. in a bit more. I mean, I know that some people, they only catch me with it when I've had a little bit to drink or when I am, if I tend to speak a lot, like if, I, if I'm going on on a, on a very extended talk, then the outs and about they they start to show up a little bit, or the you know the a's that get dropped every once in a while, or just the Canadian words that we bring up, like you know grab your ski took and get your feet off the Chesterfield, and uh, you know where's the where's the electrical pole or the hy- the hydro pole the hydro pole. You have a hydro bill, right? They're like, what the heck is a hydro bill? I don't yeah. know. Um, all right, so I want to first off. Um, one of the things that that's come up in the the work that I've seen from you over the years, and, and we're going to cover the gamut here as much as we can during this conversation. One of the things that comes up is meetings when it comes to productivity. And I know that you've got a lot of other stuff that you cover. We want to get into the idea of the second in command and the COO stuff. But I know for a fact that we've got some people listening here going, uh, meetings is one of the biggest time sucks of productivity. I've, yeah. I've offered some of my insights on this, but if, if someone – is in an organization right now. And they're like, you know, they're being weighed down by meetings, especially, you know, as we're recording this in this era where there is no buffer time, uh, you know, the, the buffer yeah. time seems to be eliminated because it's all virtual. How, yeah. how do they, how do they, how do they navigate that or at best eliminate them? <laughs> uh, well, we, we shouldn't eliminate them. We should just make our meetings more productive. And it's, it's interesting. I wrote a book called meetings suck. And the, the reason for writing that book, I was coaching a company in Florida for about four years. They went from 40 employees up to 700 employees. When they were about the 400 employee mark, their CEO, Bobby, said, you know, our meetings really suck. And I said, well, how many of your managers and leaders have been trained on running highly effective meetings? And he goes, uh, probably none. And I'm like, okay, how many of your employees, the 400 employees, how many of them have been trained on how to show up at a meeting how to participate and attend and and lead up in a meeting. He goes, for sure, none. And I said, well, then your meetings don't suck. You suck at running meetings. And he started laughing because it really dawned on him that his entire company was doing something that they didn't have the base level skills to do. And I said, you know, we would never send our kid off to play little league baseball without teaching him how to hold the bat or catch the ball or toss the ball. We'd give them the basic skills Otherwise, our kid would come home from baseball and say, Daddy, baseball sucks. It's like, no, Johnny, you suck at baseball. So to answer your kind of your question on on buffer time, one of the rules I put in meeting suck for every meeting is you finish every meeting five minutes prior to the scheduled ending time. So if we're booked, as you and I are speaking today, and we're booked from 1130 till 1230, my rule is we're done at 1225 which allows me to go down the hall, call my assistant, go to the bathroom, grab something out of the fridge. If I'm in a physical office, I can go to the bathroom, grab a cup of coffee, whatever. But I always have that five minute buffer because I finish every phone call, every Zoom meeting, every CO Alliance meeting five minutes prior to the scheduled ending time. What I also do is I start every meeting by telling the people that I'm with that we finish five minutes early so that we can show up on time. And that always wows them because they're like, oh, that's the fix that we never knew of. So I love that idea. I love the idea of um, setting boundaries. You know, I think that that we should do that more things. One of the things that I, I wanna touch on is as I look through the work that you've done, book writing especially, you've covered a gamut. Um, exp- 
how has that body of work kind of, how have you felt that body of work's been forged over the past? You know, you've, you've been doing this for a while, like yeah. the path. I'd love to hear the, the story sure. of the path to where you're at and, and where you're at now, especially as we get to the COO Alliance stuff. Yeah. So, so well, where I'm at now is I've written five books, but I had no desire to ever write one. I, I'm not a writer. I suck at writing. I hated English classes. I'm, I'm, I like the idea of having a book written, but I don't like the idea of sitting down and writing a book. 11 years ago, the CEO, 12 years ago now, the CEO of a company called grasshopper.com, David Hauser, called me up and he said, can you write the manual for my team on how to do PR, how to generate free press coverage? And I'm like, yeah, no, I don't want to do that. And he said, well, I'm going to pay you. Like, I'll pay you a couple grand just to write like a 20 page manual on how to do PR. I'm like, yeah, I'll do that. I'm like, so, so that was, you know, 12 years ago, I wrote this like 20 page document, maybe 15 pages on how to build a PR team and blah, blah. And he loved it. And I was like, well, that was really easy. I wonder if I could do that for the rest of the stuff that I know and that I coach on. So I, I wrote Double Double, my first book. And I basically created the table of contents for the book. And then I, for each chapter that I was thinking of, what would be in the table of contents, I came up with some rough topic ideas. And then I walked around my home. This was back in the day with Dragon Dictation. And I just dictated all of the stuff off the top of my head, sent it to a, a writer. I think it was called um, Upwork or Odesk back in the day. And I sent it off to a writer and she edited it. She was in Sweden. And then David Hauser's wife turned out to be a professional book editor so she ended up editing all of the 17 chapters for my book, Double Double, and that book went to press and did really well. And I thought, well, that was pretty, not simple, but very effective. It built my brand. It was doing really well. And then the second book I did was Meeting Suck, and that was just because Bobby, the CEO, was complaining about it. I'm like, it's so freaking simple, but we're all sitting here complaining and we're not fixing the root cause. So I just decided to finally codify it in a very simple way so that the first third of the book is how to run meetings. The second third of the book is how to attend them and participate as an attendee. And then the third part of the book is what meetings you really need to run a highly successful business. And that book just took off. People bought, you know, 40 copies for their employees, 120 copies for their employees instead of buying one. So then it was just go from there. I, I co-authored The Miracle Morning for Entrepreneurs with Hal Elrod. Um, I wrote the book Free PR and then co-authored that with one of my former coaching clients, the CEO of Canvas Pop, Adrian, and then did Vivid Vision, which has just really taken off. Um, Vision Laklani from Mind Valley has just really pushed out Vivid Vision to a couple million people recently. So you're an author now, like you're full. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it took it yeah. took a couple books, but I want to I want to dive a bit more into the COO stuff because yeah. we hear so much and we read a lot about the CEO help for the CEO, yeah. the CEO, yeah. and you went would arguably some would say one step below, but I don't think that's the case. It's I think it's it's oh, it it, it, I think let's put it this way: I ranking wise, yes, but I think I mean the COO. There's so much there. My operations coordinator, like without her, whew, things don't run the way they need to. So why did you decide to devote your attention to the, the role of the COO? So I, I was uh, in my prior life, the COO for 1-800-GOT-JUNK. So I took 1-800-GOT-JUNK. I was the 14th employee and I took them to 3,100 employees in six years. And I knew how to build the company. Brian, who's my best friend and was the CEO knew what he wanted to build, but didn't know how to do it. So what we realized was Brian was in EO and YPO, and I was in all these, these groups learning as well. And I realized that the entrepreneur or the CEO should know what needs to happen, but the COO, VP operations, whatever, really the leadership team needs to know how to do it. And then I recognized that there were groups for marketers and there were organizations for engineers and lawyers and finance people. There were all these organizations, but there was really nowhere for the COO. And I was coaching all these really great companies, typically 50 to 500 employees that all had COOs and there was nowhere for them to go learn. And they kept going to these entrepreneur events to try to learn, but those, it's a different crowd. It's kind of like, it's like a guy going to a, to a baby shower. We just don't belong. But we're not supposed to be at the baby shower, right? That's for the women. So COOs should not be at entrepreneur events and entrepreneurs would go crazy at a CO Alliance event, right? They'd hate it. Yeah. So I just created that network for them. 
it's interesting because some of the events I've gone to, I'm sure you've gone to some of the same. There are, I know that I would split up with somebody who is in my team. I would send them to the, like the how to, and I would be the, the, the kind of the vision, like the bigger picture stuff. But yeah. it's, it's, I've been in those ones where I'm like, I don't need to know how to do this. I just need to know that we need to do this. And then right. so an, entre- an entrepreneur needs to know that we need to get all the right people into the company and there's systems to interview. The COO needs to spend a couple of days learning how to do perfect the interview process so they can roll out systems internally for all managers to interview. The CEO, CEO doesn't want to know all that stuff. They just want to know that it's being done. Can, can COOs, I mean, I guess it's happened for you, I guess, to a degree. COOs and C, like a COO could become a CEO for sure, right? Or is, yeah, it a tri- I, is it a tricky beast? It's tricky. I was an entrepreneur first. I, I had, uh, when I was 21 years old, I had 12 employees in my first company. So I, I ran a business for three years while I was in university. I then, I then was a, a, a partner in Boyd Auto Body and I joined it to grow the franchising group there. So I'd done it three times before joining Brian. I had been kind of on that entrepreneur, second in command kind of role, but I'm definitely an odd duck. My, my profiles, if you look at like my disc profile, I'm very entrepreneurial. I'm a 98D and a 74I. If you look at my Colby profile, I'm a 4393, which is a high quick start, very entrepreneurial. But because I've built all these franchise companies, I think in systems terms, and I think in terms of the shortcuts for systems, which is very COO. Um, so I think I'm a very different archetype to the traditional COO for sure. Okay, so I, I- and, and I and I would be a horrible COO for a big company, right? Once one eight hundred got drunk, when we got to a hundred million, it was too big for me. Like I, I'm so, so I'm, I'm a good COO in that kind of entrepreneurial kind of the million to hundred million phase. Brian on the show before, we'll make sure we put a link in the show notes for sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, because it was a really interesting conversation. And, and one of the things that, that as you bring this up, I, I used to be an operations manager when I worked for the Victoria film festival. So my job was to make the show run. I, I, I got grants during it's, it was quite hilarious. You'd, during the, the downtime, the office looked like an accountant's office. Like everyone's writing grants, heads down. But during the festival, you wouldn't want to be anywhere near there. Frenetic pace, everything moving around. I would sleep occasionally at the office during the festival for those, you know, for those those couple of weeks it was running because it was just that operationally that's that was the the prime time. And then there was yeah. the the leader who was um who was you know she she was the figurehead and she did a lot of you know she was the the, the face of the the, the festival. But there was a point where, I mean, operationally, I knew how to run it and I was great at it, but I also had that entrepreneurial mindset like you, like you talked about. How, how do you know when to, like in your, in what you're doing right now, do you, do you occasionally turn on that COO stuff inside your own business or do you really challenge yourself to go, you know what? No, I'm going to let them handle it. And I'm, I, I'll keep my eyes open. Like, how do you make sure that you don't flip the switch to the point where it's detrimental to either side of the business? Yeah, I think, I think the, the, the art of it really is understanding when the company is scaling enough to start letting go of some of those areas. So I'm always trying to delegate everything except genius. And I'm also trying to scale the organization so that it throws off enough EBITDA and throws off enough, you know, scale and keeps everybody happy that, I, I could add four more people to the organization, but I'd prefer to have the extra half million bottom line. So, you know, it's, it's a, it's a test between, you know, what will I work on and what will I outsource? Right. Um, so I definitely, I definitely delegate and outsource both a lot of what I could do. Um, but it's because I want time, you know, I've, I've already since, so it's November as we're, we're talking right now, I've had 11 weeks vacation at this point, completely off. And I just, on top of that, just came back from six weeks in Italy where I only worked three days a week. So I've had a lot of free time this year, but I'm still very hands-on in some areas of the business. Let's talk about delegation. That actually is a nice segue to the idea of delegation. A lot of people who are running their own businesses or are even at a, at a higher level, like at that COO level, but they, they're, they're trying to do it all. Like they, they're not really leveraging the ability to delegate to some of their team members or even outsource like you did earlier with, you know, Upwork and, and places like that. What are some of the lessons that you've learned 
and that really have stuck with you regarding delegation for not just the role that you have now, but obviously in that COO, that second in command role? You know, it's interesting. It's, I, I launched a course uh, in February called Invest in Your Leaders. And the, uh, there's 12 modules in the course that all managers and leaders should go through. The eighth module is delegation. And most managers have never had any training on delegation. Like they've never sat through a couple of hours or an hour to really understand delegation. So I'll give you a specific example. If I said to my assistant, um, Mike Vardy and I are going to have dinner. It's a really important one. Book dinner for he and I tomorrow night for an hour. She might book us at like a great steakhouse and have the wine decanted and corner table in a quiet area. What I really meant was, it's really important that we can sit and talk <clears throat> and do it at my office. And look, he's not a fancy guy. Like 50 bucks is good. Like let's get Uber Eats to deliver it just to handle it for me. But I delegated very poorly. <clears throat> the second thing is, so you always want to delegate the amount of money that you want spent, what finished looks like, and how little time you want them to spend. And this is one that no manager does properly. Most, most, most leaders will say, oh, this will only take you an hour, to which the person they're delegating to, no, it'll do this and this and this and this. If the leader switched that and said, I only want you to spend an hour, do as best as you can in that hour, spend no more than the hour, and this is what I want it to look like, they would do their best possible job in the hour. But Parkinson's law says work expands to fill the space that we give it. Yep. So unless you delegate time boundaries, money boundaries, and the real description of what finished looks like, no one will be able to do well at it. The other parts is, do the people you're delegating to have the skills and the confidence, right, which is situational leadership, do they have the skills and the confidence to do those actual tasks and projects? And again, most leaders have never been trained on situational leadership. It's the first module of the 12 that I teach in my Invest in Your Leaders course. And it, 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 it's always frustrated me when CEOs say, oh, business is hard. No, business is really simple. But you have a bunch of people doing stuff that they've never been trained to do. If you would actually flip the org chart upside down and support them and give them the skills and the confidence to do their job, business gets easy. Right. It, it's interesting as you brought that up. I mean, I've, I've, I've not done that. I mean, I'm, and the thing is I teach with productivity is like projects and tasks are often objective. How we approach them are subjective. Like to your point where it's like, here, make this landing page and this is what I want. Well, if they've got a lot of experience in that, they can get that done in way less time than I could. Or if they don't, it might take them longer. But if you put that parameter in there, that framing of like only spend, you know, an hour or two or whatever it's going to be, then you, then you, you get a lot more subtext and clues out of that than you would by leaving it. This should only take an hour. Yeah. I've never, that's, that's, I like how you flip that there. Well, and here's, here's another tie into that. If you delegate a project to somebody who has the skills to do it, like they've always been able to do it, but they're overwhelmed because they've got 73 other projects on their plate, that project's not getting done. And under the guise of situational leadership, you would have adapted your style based on the added point value of, of their skill set and, and confidence, or sorry, the commitment. When that changes, you have to adapt or adapt your style. But if leaders aren't trained in situational leadership, they suck at coaching, they suck at one-on-one -on -one meetings, they suck at classroom teaching, they suck at, at, at um, delegation, and, and all of a sudden they've got conflict in their team because their teams aren't getting led properly. And it's just because people haven't had the base level skills. I'm really fortunate that I got all of these skills at College Pro Painters. I got my real world MBA at College Pro. Wow, that's, that's fantastic. I mean, College Pro is all over you know, where I live, where you live. I mean, I think they're, they're are they international or are they just? Uh... Well, they actually just closed after 50 years in business. I'm friends with Greg Clark, the founder. This was their final year. Um, they were in 43 states, nine provinces. Uh, the reason they closed was they couldn't find enough guys like me or women like me to run businesses in university because they were all running internet businesses, flip businesses. So they struggled, but I hired Kimball Musk. Elon's brother worked for me as a franchisee in 1993, and his cousin who built Solar City worked for me in 1993 as well. But yeah, I got a real, it was the world's largest residential painting company. Huh. I didn't, I didn't realize that. Well, I'll give you, I'll give you a perception on scope. 
every year they went out and hired 800 university kids to be franchisees in four months and had to train them to run a business. And then in six weeks, we had to train those 800 people to hire 8,000 university kids to paint houses and train them. And then in four months, we painted $64 million in houses. And then September 1st, everyone quit and went back to university. The 60 of us at the head office, and I was in the top 30 people in the company, would all get drunk on September 1st. September, September 2nd, we would do it again. We had to build an 8,800 person company every single year in the seven years I was there. It really sounds like a much, much bigger version of me in the film festival. Like that, that yeah. truncated period. That's... That's intense. I, so, but they, so they obsessed with training us on the skills to do what we had to do. Otherwise, we were going to fail. Um, I've often said that there is a, and, and I mean, I want to get your insights on this, but when people talk about time management, I prefer to use, I hate that term because time moves on whether you want it to or not. I mean, it's, it's uh, and when you, may, and my understanding, and this comes from my education at Costco, because I learned a lot of stuff at Costco. They've, they've, they've dialed in some pretty interesting things. One of the things that I told you before we hit record that I started off in Burlington, Ontario, so not too far from, from where I was from, and I moved out to Port Coquitlam. But on the way, I was trying to move up. And the, uh, the, the district manager who happened to be based out of Burnaby um, said, you know, Mike, You've applied, you've applied, you've got all the hard skills that we need, but you need the soft skills. We're not going to put you in this position until you have the soft skills. And then he explained to me something, you know, like empathy and things, things that are that lead, some of the things that were related to leadership as opposed to management. Mm -hmm. And once I started to go down that path a bit more, um, the opportunity arose. So I've always thought of time management as like, okay, you can, you can move things around and you can, it's like moving blocks, but the blocks are going where they were, where they go here. You don't get to decide necessarily where to go. Whereas time leadership, which is what I prefer to say, um, is something where you're leading your time. You're getting it to where to, you're leveraging it. You're, you're moving it in the direction you want it to go in. I'd love to hear your thoughts on the differences between leadership and management. Yeah. I, so I've, I was trained in something called priority management, where we take a look at all the stuff we need to do and we prioritize it into A's and B's. Then we take all the A's and we number them in the highest priority, A1, A2, all the way through, and take all the B's and prioritize them. And then we figure out how much time each of those projects will take in terms of hours or days. And then we figure out where we're going to put them in our calendar. And sure enough, we realize we don't have enough time in our calendar to do all the stuff we need to do. So we decide what are we going to delegate or optimize or outsource, and then do the people have the skills and can we coach them on doing it? One of my former clients taught me something that was really beautiful. Every Sunday night, she comes up with her list of priorities that she needs to do, figures out the time for each of them, adds up the total time, and then before she starts doing anything, including checking a single email Monday morning, she delegates 80% of the hours on her list. Wow. Because the reality is, like you said, we only have enough time you don't need a to-do list. Your calendar is the perfect to-do list. Put the things you have to do in your calendar and you'll realize you don't have enough hours in the day or competency or people to do that stuff. So then you have to find other ways to do it. But stop saying you ran out of time. I love when, <laughs> so there's quantitative and qualitative stuff, right? When it comes to this stuff, like the amount mm -hmm. of math helps with this totally because you're right. Like we only have so many hours in the day, so many days in the week, so many, you know, you know, months in the year, et cetera. When you start to math, it, it's, I think that's why people love inbox zero so much, getting your email down to zero because it's quantitative, right? What, what are your, th <laughs> you're smirking. So what do you hear? I want to hear some. No, I'm, I'm, I'm laughing because time management or priority management is module six of my course and email management, email management is module 10. Again, if people haven't been trained on how to do this shit, of course it overwhelms them, right? Like there's basic core skills that every manager and leader needs. So I taught Bobby, this guy from Blue Grace, again, number one company to work for in Florida, Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year in the state of Florida, president of his YPO chapter, grows from 40 to 700 people. I teach him email management. He goes, oh, this is going to change the company. I'm like, no, it's going to change you. But we'll change the company is teaching all 700 people this principle of inbox zero that I learned from Starbucks. My mentor was being groomed as a CEO at Starbucks. He had inbox zero every single day. How is it possible that a C-level at the major companies can do this? Well, because they've been trained in the skills. 
Yeah, and it's true. A lot of it, a lot of what happens is the technology shows up, and there's no training uh, because there's. It, it, it's one of the things I've said is, man, it would have been so much better if, in some instances, instant messaging showed up before email. Well, how much training have has anybody had on this thing? Right, I'm holding up an iPhone. Most people, and we've been using them for 12 years, and we've never had any training. Like we're complete morons, and yet we walk around going, "Business is hard." No, it's really simple. And and what's funny about as we hold up our phones is. The, the way the phones are given to us is it's the way that they want us to use the phones and not the way that we want to use them. And so instead of taking the time to, you know, is this the right, is this the right, I don't use the native iOS email app. I don't use the native notes app. I use the one that's going to, that actually, number one, I've had training in to your point. And number two, the one that's going to get me uh, the better results. You know, I mean, there's one of the things I used to do early on, I used to write for the cult of Mac and next web. And I was very much in a Mac guy still am. Everything I have is, is Apple, but I know that the world works, you know, in very different, especially the business world, web-based windows, Android, like you can't forsake those because as soon as you start doing that, you're eliminating a good percentage of the population. So I tend to use tools that will work across multiple platforms. And by doing that and getting the training in that, all of a sudden I've scaled myself and my ability to not only scale myself, but to scale the people I can bring on board to a much greater degree. Well, I think you'll appreciate this story because you're from British Columbia as well. So you know the name Jimmy Patterson. He's the most, the biggest and most successful entrepreneur in British Columbia. He employs more people than anyone except the government. Okay, so for anyone listening, that's how big Jimmy is. Jimmy's about 85, maybe 88 years old. About five years ago, I was sitting at our tennis club, Vancouver Lawn and Tennis, and he walked in with an with a MacBook and an iPhone, and he was sitting down. And this young girl, about 24 years old, came in. And Jimmy walked up to her and handed her a $50 bill and they sat down and he said, I heard these things can talk to you. Can you show me how that works? And I'm really struggling with doing this. Can you teach me how that'll work? He was the most successful entrepreneur in the province and he was humble enough to turn to a 24 year old who didn't know how to do his job, but she could show him how to leverage technology. And I was like, that's what has to happen, right? And we've got, and we've seen, we've heard examples of this with, you know, people like Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett and these the super successful people that, you know, number one, they know what they know and they're okay with not knowing what they don't know. Right. And that's an example of that. Uh, Cameron, before I let you go, I want to touch on a little bit about um, the second in command podcast. And, and, and so tell me a little bit about the podcast, where people can listen to it and what, what you found while, you know, bringing this podcast to life and putting it out there. Because it's definitely very neat. It's it's a niche podcast for sure. Definitely niche. Yeah, I just I just interviewed this morning the second in command for Mind Body, and I have the the uh, second in command for Zoom Info coming on this afternoon. So I've got what we did was I recognized that when we were building one eight hundred got junk, Brian would get interviewed by the media, and I'd listen to the interview. I'm like, yeah, that's pretty true, but there was this other side to the story. And then he would hear me get interviewed by the media and he'd be like, yeah, that's pretty true. But there was his side of the story. And I started to look that most of the interviews, we were only hearing the entrepreneur's side of the story. And then I thought, if you ask my mom and dad, who both raised us as children, they raised us in the same home for our entire lives. If you said to my mom, how did you raise your kids? She would have a very different story than my dad. And they would both be true. So what I wanted was the rest of the story on how these companies scaled and I wanted to be able to turn to these COOs and just ask them their stories. So we've had, you know, Shopify and the Cleveland Indians and Bumble and really great brands that we've gotten the rest of the story because we've heard it from the entrepreneur, but I wanted to hear it from the COO. So it's called the, it's called the second in command. Pardon me? Oh, Shopify. Because you know, Tobias is the oh. CEO and I know Harley yeah. is the CFO, right? Is Harley COO now? Harley was, has been CEO, yeah, for about five or six years, Harley Finkelstein. I met them when they were 40 employees. I went into their office in Ottawa. To, I spoke, spoke to their company, and I was like, wow, these guys are amazing. And um, holy shit, have they executed, man. And by word market, right? The one just yep. off of, yeah, I went in there, yep. and Harley and I had a cute story place. Yep, yep, little black awning. Yeah, yeah. Black, yeah, I remember going in there and talking to Harley and he was, uh, cause he was a big fan of the five by five network and I was doing my podcast on five by five. So he knew Dan Benjamin and he was into productivity. We had a chat yeah. and that was, and now I'm like, holy smokes. Like <laughs> just, they were, and they've earned it, man. They've earned it. 
They're, they're total level five leaders, right? They've got the humility, they've got the drive, they obsess about employee engagement. What's really interesting there is every COO, and we talk a lot about this on the Second in Command podcast, every COO is very different because they're the yin and yang to the CEO. So in Tobias's case, he's very engineering and product focused. Harley is very business development, culture focused. At 1-800-GOT-JUNK, I did not run IT and finance. At Shopify, Harley runs finance. So every COO runs the areas that the CEO sucks at. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think I need to, uh, I think my wife needs to become the CFO officially (laughs) in our business for sure. Right? Because like, there's just stuff that drains us of energy and there's stuff that that we're just not good at that they love to do and it inspires them. We should just hook them up with it. Actually, just real quick sidebar, I was having a conversation with my wife about bookkeeping and such, and she's an acupuncturist and she loves doing it. I'm like, okay, at the end of the day, which job will be the last one you, you give up? Like when you're done? Cause she's, you know, and she goes, oh, probably the bookkeeping one. I'm like, really? And she, wow. and she's like, well, I do acupuncture, but remember, I mean, that takes body work, right? So over time that gets really challenging. Plus, I mean, I, you know, I mean, she loves doing it. But, you know, the older she gets, eventually it's going to be harder and harder for her to do. She goes, and I like doing it because it's it's something that I know where the money's going. I can track our success. I'm like, okay, I didn't have that concept. And that led me to just make a note of, okay, maybe we need to have a, di- a, a different kind of conversation going forward. So I think communication's that, huge. That ties back into delegation as well, that you have to find the person to delegate the project or task to who really wants to do it and who has the skills to do it. And it may not always be tied to the title of the person. There might be someone better to do the project and they might be more inspired as well. Yeah. Well, uh, the course we're going to link to in the show notes, right? It's available on your website. Where else can people keep up with you and the work that you do? So the COO Alliance website is COAlliance.com. My Cameron Herald website, just CameronHerald.com. All five of my books are available on Amazon, Audible, and iTunes, and then the Second in Command podcast and investinyourleaders.com. Cameron, thanks for having a productive conversation with me today. Hey, Mike, appreciate it. It's been great. Another conversation with another Canadian in the books. Thanks to Cameron for joining me on the program. If you want to get access to all the things that he shared and helpful links and all that stuff, head to productivityist.com slash podcast 417-417 to make that happen. You can also just check out the show notes that are on your podcasting app that you're using right now, but there's more in-depth stuff when you go to that URL. By the way, while you're looking at that podcast app right now, why not hit the subscribe button? That way you don't miss a single episode of what's to come and you can easily access all of our past episodes, which includes recent conversations with Ian Morgan Cron and very special episodes with Liam Martin, Austin Cleon, and so many more. As a matter of fact, you can listen to some of the past episodes with Chris Bailey and Austin Cleon when you subscribe because you can just find them far faster and far easier. So again, hit that subscribe button wherever you listen to podcasts. Another way to support the show is by checking out our sponsors. The sponsors that you heard today, they can be found at productivityist.com slash podcast sponsors. Let them know that I sent you. I'm going to send you to next week's episode through this podcasting app that you're using right now, or if you're listening on the website, because Joshua Becker returns to the program to talk about his latest book. And it's a conversation that really matters. I really hope you'll check it out. Until then, I'm Mike Vardy, the host of A Productive Conversation, reminding you to stop doing productive and start being productive. I'll see you later.